dynamic that they might not be working at a single plant for 30 years but they might have to change careers they might have to get uh, more education they might have to uh, retool or retrain uh, and I think the American people are game for that they want to make sure that the rules of the game are fair and what that means is that uh, if if you look at surveys around uh, Americans' attitudes on trade, the majority of the American people still support trade, but they're concerned about whether or not trade is fair and whether we've got the same access to other countries' markets as they have with us. Is there just a race to the bottom when it comes to wages and so forth? Now, I made an argument uh, thus far unsuccessfully that the trade deal we had organized, TPP, uh, did exactly that, that it strengthened workers' rights and environmental rights, leveled the playing field, and as a consequence would be good for American workers and American businesses. Um, but that's a, a complex argument to make when people remember plants closing and jobs uh, being offshore. So part of what uh, I think this election reflected was people wanting that course correction that you described and the, the message around stopping surges of immigration not creating new trade deals that may be unfair. Uh, I think those were themes that uh, played a prominent role in the campaign. As we now shift to governing, my argument is that uh, we do need to make sure that we have an orderly lawful immigration process, but that if it is orderly and lawful, Immigration is good for our economy. It keeps this country young. It keeps it dynamic. We have entrepreneurs and strivers who come here and are willing to take risks, and uh, that's part of the reason why uh, America historically has been successful. It's part of the reason why our economy is stronger and better positioned than most of our other uh, competitors is because we got a younger population that's more dynamic. Um, when it comes to trade, I think... You know, when you're governing, it'll become increasingly apparent that if you were to just eliminate trade deals uh, with Mexico, for example, well, you've got a global supply chain. The parts that are allowing uh, auto plants that were about to shut down to now employ double shifts is because they're bringing in some of those parts uh, to assemble out of Mexico. And so it's not as simple as it might have seemed. Uh, and, and you know, the key for us, when I say us, I mean Americans, but I think particularly for progressives, uh, is to say uh, your concerns are real, your anxieties are real. Here's how we fix them. Higher minimum wage. Stronger uh, worker protection so workers have more leverage to get a bigger piece of the pie. Stronger financial re regulations, not weaker ones. Yes to trade, but trade that ensures that these other countries that trade with us aren't engaging in child labor, for example. Um, being attentive to inequality uh, and not tone deaf to it, uh, but offering prescriptions that are actually going to help folks uh, uh, in communities that feel forgotten. That's going to be uh, our most important strategy. And uh, and I think we can successfully do that. Uh, people will still be looking to the United States. Uh, our example will uh, still carry great weight. Um, and it uh, continues to be my strong belief that the way we are going to make sure that everybody feels a part of this global economy is not by shutting ourselves off from each other, even if we could, 
but rather by working together more effectively than we have in the past. Martha Reynolds. Thanks, Mr. President. Given some of the harsh words you had about Mr. Trump calling him temperamentally unfit to be commander in chief, did anything surprise you about President elect Trump when you met with him in your office? And also, I want to know does anything concern you about a Trump president? Well, um, we had a very uh, cordial conversation, and uh, that didn't surprise me to some degree uh, because I think that he is obviously a gregarious person. He's somebody who uh, I think likes to mix it up uh, and to, to uh, have a, a vigorous debate. Um, and uh, you know, what's clear is that he was able to tap into uh, Yes, the anxieties, but also the enthusiasm of his voters, uh, uh, in a way that uh, that was impressive, and and I said so to him uh, because I think that um, to the extent that there were a lot of uh, folks who missed the Trump phenomenon, I think that connection that he was able to make with his supporters um, that was impervious to events that might have sunk another candidate. Uh, that's powerful stuff. Um, I also think that he is coming to this office uh, with fewer set hard and fast policy prescriptions than a lot of other presidents might uh, be arriving with. Uh, I don't think he is ideological. Uh, I think ultimately is he's pragmatic in that way, uh, and uh, that can serve him well uh, as long as he's got good people around him and he has a, a clear sense of direction. Um, do I have concerns? Absolutely. Of course, I've got concerns. You know, he and I uh, differ on a whole bunch of issues. Um, but uh, you know, the federal government and our democracy uh, is not a speedboat. It's an ocean liner, as I discovered when I came into office. It took a lot of really hard work for us to make significant policy changes, even in our first two years when we had uh, larger majorities than Mr. Trump will enjoy when he comes into office. And... Uh, you know, one of the things I advised him to do was to make sure that before he commits to certain courses of action, he's really dug in and thought through um, how various issues play themselves out. I, I'll, I'll use uh, a obvious example uh, where we have a difference, but it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, in the coming year, and that's the Affordable Care Act. So, Obviously, this has been uh, the holy grail for Republicans over the last six, seven years, was we've got to kill Obamacare. Now, uh, that has been taken as an article of faith, that this is terrible, it doesn't work, and we have to undo it. But now that Republicans are in charge, they've got to take a look and say, let's see, we've got 20 million people who have health insurance who didn't have it before. Health care costs generally have gone up at a significantly slower rate since Obamacare was passed than they did before, which has saved the federal treasury hundreds of billions of dollars. People who have health insurance are benefiting in all sorts of ways that they may not be aware of, everything from no longer having lifetime limits on uh, the claims that they can make to seniors getting prescription drug down discounts uh, under Medicare uh, to free mammograms. Now, it's one thing to characterize these, this thing as not working when it's just an abstraction. Now, suddenly, you're in charge and you're going to repeal it. Okay, well... What happens to those 20 million people who have health insurance? 
are you going to just kick them off and suddenly they don't have health insurance? And in, in what ways are their lives better because of that? Are you going to repeal the provision that ensures that if you do have health insurance on your job and you lose your job or you change jobs or you start a small business that you're not discriminating against because you got a pre-existing condition, that's really popular. How are you going to replace it? Um, are you going to change the policy that kids can stay on their parents' health insurance plan until they're 26? Uh, how are you going to approach all these issues? Now, my view is that if they can come up with something better that actually works and a, a year or two after they've replaced the Affordable Care Act with their own plan, that 25 million people have health insurance and it's cheaper and better and running smoothly, I'll be the first one to say that's great. Congratulations. If, on the other hand, whatever they're proposing results in millions of people losing coverage and results in people who already have health insurance losing protections that uh, were contained in the legislation, then we're going to have a problem. Uh, and I think that's not going to be unique uh, to me. I think the American people will respond that way. Um, so I think on a lot of issues, what you're going to see is now comes the hard part. Now is governance. We are going to be able to present to the incoming administration uh, a country that is stronger, a federal government that is working better and more efficiently, uh, a national security apparatus that is both more effective and truer to our values, energy policies that are uh, resulting in not just less pollution but also more jobs, and um, I think the, the president-elect, rightly, would expect that he's judged on whether we improve from that baseline and on those metrics or things get worse. And if things get worse, then the American people will figure that out pretty quick. And if things get better, then more power to them. And, and I'll be the first to congratulate him. Mr. Mr. President, you had talked specifically about his temperament. Mm -hmm. Do you still have any concern about his temperament? As I said, because Athena asked the question, um, whatever you bring to this office, uh, this office has a, uh, a habit of uh, magnifying and pointing out, and hopefully then you correct for it. Uh, this may seem like a silly example, but I know myself well enough to know I can't keep track of paper. I am not well organized in that way. And so pretty quickly, after I'm getting stacks of briefing books coming in every night, I say to myself, I've got to figure out a system because uh, I have bad filing, sorting, and organizing habits. And I've got to find some people who can help me keep track of this stuff. Now, that, that seems trivial, but actually it ends up being uh, a pretty big piece of business. I think what will happen with the president-elect is there are going to be certain elements of his temperament that will not serve him well unless he recognizes them and corrects them. Because um, when you're a candidate and you say something that is inaccurate or uh, controversial, it has less impact than it does when you're President of the United States. Uh, everybody around the world is paying attention. Markets move. Um, national s security uh, issues uh, require a level of precision in order to make sure that you don't make mistakes. Uh, and I think he's, he recognizes that um, this is different and so do the American people. All right, I'm going to take just a couple more questions.